Thank you. Well, first, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure to be back uh, after 10 years, I guess, last time when Lin Ping was still here, uh, <laughs> probably over 10 years ago. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, uh, Wei Qing and Wei Zhu and other organizers for the uh, kind invitation. And uh, following Jie Shen, I save a lot of uh, you know, uh, my effort to explain what uh, these uh, you know, uh, numerical techniques are. So I'm going to focus more on the models because uh, this technique uh, is very general, uh, which can be applied to nearly everything if you do it right. Okay? So I call this thermodynamically consistent models. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so first I want to say uh, this work is based on a, a series of papers published uh, in the uh, last two years. Uh, and uh, the main contributors are listed over there. Uh, my former uh, postdoc, uh, Yue Zheng Gong, he's uh, brilliant. And also my colleague, Xiao Feng Yang, uh, another brilliant uh, computational scientist. And also my former student, uh, Jia, Shen, uh, uh, Jia Zhao, who is assistant professor at the Utah State now. Okay. And we have several others uh, which their names appear in the publications, but I don't want to uh, list them in this uh, page. So I'm going to uh, run this down in uh, three steps. So first, I'll just give you a, a very simple example, the heat equation. Okay? And, and then I'm going to focus on the general formulation uh, uh, we have heard a few times uh, in this workshop, which is called the Onsager's Principle. Now, uh, if I say Onsager's Principle for physicists, they will think Onsager reciprocal relation. Okay? But actually, I'm going to define uh, clearly what do I mean by Onsager Principle. Uh, and then I'm going to draw attention to the second law of thermodynamics. It's sort of equivalent, but uh, people think Onsager Principle is more general. Okay, at least. Uh, uh, Professor Qian probably will argue with that. And then I will uh, uh, discuss the numerical approximation. I call this structure property preserving numerical approximations. Okay. And, and then I will show you uh, several examples. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about ICV because Jie Xin has spent uh, you know, uh, almost an hour to talk about that. So I will focus on the uh, EQ method. So what do we mean by thermodynamical consistent models? Uh, if you uh, look at the, the, the mathematical models or any models, because in science engineering, if you want to describe anything, you need to write down equations. Okay? So when you have equations, then you, you, you claim you have a model. So model is a story. If you, if you leave the context of science engineering, a model is, is a story. Like in astrophysics, the story changes every year. Okay? And what that means is a story is not the truth. Story is approximation to the truth. Maybe you only see the truth from one side of the faucet. Okay? So never believe in your story is always the story for that truth. So uh, if you have a story in, in, in the context of uh, you know, describing material systems or matter systems, so normally we apply the uh, theory called thermodynamics to try to derive a model for that. So in thermodynamics, there are three laws, first, second, and third. Normally, the third law basically just defines the absolute, absolute temperature. It's the first and the second laws which are most important. The first law basically tells you the conservation of energy. The second law tells you the, 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 the real well-posedness, mathematically speaking, of that system. So if you can design your model correctly following these laws, and then you prove, you apply your mathematical machinery to prove it, probably it's already there. You just need to use the technique to carry out the technical part of this uh, execution. Okay. So therefore, the second law most of the time is phrased as a positive entropy production. In other words, you, your, your system, if your system is, is going back, relaxing to the equilibrium, and during this process, your entropy is supposed to be increased, not decreased. So that's the second law in terms of Glaucian uh, uh, Duhan inequality. Right? And uh, there are many equivalent formalisms or formulations. Uh, so uh, Onsager principle, I'm going to define clearly what it is. And there's also a generic formalism. Uh, there's a book about it by Ertinger, <coughs> published in 2000. And then there's a Poisson bracket formulation, also in the book, 
published by Barris, uh, Tony Barris and uh, Brian Edward in 1994. And also there is an energetic variational principle uh, which has been advocated by my friend uh, uh, Chun Liu for many years. Okay. So this one actually originated from the rational me mechanics community, schools, for many years. And then there's a, uh, this Onsager matchlap action potential formalism which was discussed by Professor Qian yesterday. Okay. So he called that Onsager's principle. So, so there's a different formulation or formalism of the same thing, all right? But uh, I'm gonna focus on the Onsager principle because this is the easiest, in my opinion, to formulate the models, which we obey all these thermodynamic principles, okay? So in addition to the thermodynamic laws, we also have other laws we have to care about. For example, mass conservation, momentum conservation, angular momentum computation, uh, uh, conservation. If you consider coupling electromagnetic theory, you have to have Maxwell equations, you know, all this stuff, you have to respect them because they are physical laws. So if your model obeys all this, what I call constraints, and then I call that thermodynamically consistent models. However, in the literature, most people just think the thermodynamically consistent models are the model which respect the second law of thermodynamics. So, so please pay attention to the difference. So I'm asking more in this uh, definition for thermodynamically consistent models. Okay? Not only have to ha satisfy the thermodynamic laws, you have to also satisfy all the other physical laws which are imposed to your systems. Okay? So numerically, you want to compute the solution of that uh, you know, model normally are governed by, for example, PDEs, right? And then you have to preserve all those properties. So if you can preserve those properties, then we call those numerical approximation structure or property preserving numerical approximations, okay? So those are the requirements for us to proceed after you get the model. All right, so this is a simple example heat equation. So first I want to demonstrate how do we derive the heat equation from the thermodynamic laws, okay? A lot of people just think thermo heat equation is the law, but actually it's derived from the, you know, second law and first law of thermodynamics, right? So actually what you begin with is not the temperature, you begin with the internal energy. So your, your internal energy, in this case, we we'll, we'll assume the total energy actually is the internal energy integrated over your material volume or domain, and then based on the conservation of energy, so you can only have energy either coming in or going out, okay? Assuming we do not have internal energy generation, internal heat generation. And therefore, this is the first law of thermodynamics, all right? And then we write this into the differential forms, and then that's the derivative forms or differential forms. And then you can postulate the Fourier law, which is actually a constitutive relation. You say the flux of the energy is proportional to the gradient of the absolute temperature, all right? But then you have to represent your internal energy in terms of, in terms of temperature. There's no loss over there, so you, what, what do you do? You linearize, so that's what people do. You assume you have a critical temperature, then you linearize your internal energy above that, then you truncate at the linear order. That's what people have done. And then the coefficient C here is actually the first derivative of your internal energy about the temperature evaluated at this critical temperature. That's called, a, called a heat capacity. So you put all this back in there, and then you can rewrite this, this equation coupled with this law into this form. So this is the heat equation. And the theta now is the temperature difference between the temperature, absolute temperature, at minus the a, a, a critical temperature, okay? So that's the heat equation. And then coefficient now here is that coefficient which actually is the conducting coefficient divided by the heat capacity, it's called the heat conductivity, all right? No, this is the way people derive from thermodynamics, okay? You can derive from other ways. All right, so now let's look at the structure. The structure is pretty, pretty simple. So we define this as a quantity, we call this energy, okay? And then we differentiate this energy about time. So assuming the boundary condition and the boundary is, uh, is either one, 
all right, either Dirichlet or Neumann at the boundary equal to zero. And then we end up with this formula. So your energy is always negative, assuming your D is non-negative, positive. All right. So this is called dissipation. So system is dissipative. And then from this energy dissipation, you immediately derive, obtain this relationship. That is, your energy will never increase. We always decrease because of dissipation. So now look at the form of this. This is actually the square of the L2 norm of theta variable. So therefore, if I use this to denote the L2 form norm, then I have this formula. What is this? This is the well posed this. So immediately from energy law, you arrive at the well posedness. So energy dissipation for this system implies well posedness of the system. But unfortunately, this relationship only applies to linear systems. For nonlinear systems, you have to prove it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay? But at least it indicates the energy dissipation is, is very important in terms of determining the well posedness of the system. All right? So that's the message I want to convey. That is, energy, inter energy dissipation implies well posedness of the equation in a linear regime for the linear system. Okay. All right, so now let's look at numerical approximation of this simple problem. Everybody knows this. You use Cranker nicholson to approximate this, right? So apply Cranker nicholson schemes to this heat equation. But then I want to use the energy notation so that the, the, the energy digitized form is given by this. So this is the, the analog of that energy dissipation law at the discrete level. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the case where you can see how energy is, is reduced from the previous time step to the next time step. So therefore, at the discrete level, you also have energy dissipation, energy decay, which implies your numerical solution semi-discretized in time. You know, it also satisfies this well postness. Okay. All right. So this whole idea actually will be generalized to arbitrary thermodynamic system as long as it's thermodynamically consistent. Okay, so it's a very, very, very simple idea, but you can generalize to very wide class of models. So now let's define what I mean by a generalized Onsager principle. So I abbreviate this as a GOP. So even though it's not a good word in the US, but uh, you know, uh, so, uh, well, this one was first used by Onsager, so that's why we, we borrow his name uh, in 1931 and then 1933 in two or three papers. But it brought to my attention by the French school, uh, the Gen school, uh, in the, uh, 2007. So the, the, I think they are the first group of people actively use this formulation to create models for active matter systems. And then we, uh, we formulate this in a more rigorous way uh, recently. Okay. So if you think about the thermodynamics, there are two key ingredients. You need to have an have a energy manifold, or we call energy surface. So anything happens is going to be happening on the surface. So then you're going to have an equilibrium, either you know, unstable ones or stable ones. So what happens is you have, you're going to have all the dynamics going on on this energy surface. Now, how do you define the path? You define mobility. So you need to have an energy surface. You need to have a mobility. These two will define the dynamics. And also, most of the models, trust me, only, only is derived near the equilibrium, not for the global dynamics, even though people apply to the global dynamics. But they are not supposed to be there. It only works near the equilibrium. Okay? So therefore, you know, if you apply this principle to a thermodynamic system, you got what, what the GHN called the gradient flows. Okay? If you apply this to general hydrodynamics, you got uh, you know, all the hydrodynamic theories for complex fluid, anything you name it. You can also include, for example, you know, electromagnetics into like uh, MHDs. In fact, uh, Arrington applied you know, similar ideas to almost anything. Okay, so you can you read his book, 11 volumes, probably cost you uh, 1,400 USDs. Okay. So there are many, many applications. And uh, I will point out that there are many uh, uh, equivalent formalism. There are some minor differences. 
but in terms of the general idea is similar. Generic Poisson bracket, uh, energetic variation, and second law of thermodynamics, and also uh, uh, Professor Chen's Anziger's uh, principle using that action potential. Yeah. All right. So let me see our version of Anziger principle. I think it's more constructive, easy to use. Everybody, everybody can use that uh, you know, by learning this in five minutes. Then you can apply to any other cases. All right. So the basic idea is that you, 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 you have to get a free energy. So this is not within this context. You have to use other means to either assume or you compute or in whatever way you can get a free energy. So assume we have free energy functional, okay? And then we postulate a, a mobility matrix. Now this guy can be operators, differential or integral operators. So this is what we call generalized. In Onsiger's original work, this, this matrix is constant coefficient. Now we can allow, allow this to be differential operators, integral operators, as long as it's quasi-linear. That, that would be OK. In other words, this one does not contain the highest order derivative in your model. It will work. All right? And then you use linear response theory. This is part of Onsiger's assumption. You assume everything goes on is near the equilibrium. So therefore, the response between the flux and the generalized force is linear. But this linearity is, is linked by the mobility matrix, which is quasi-linear operator matrix. All right. And then if you write down this energy, and then you calculate the energy, the time rate of change of energy about time, then you can end up with an inner product. The inner product is a flux times the force which can be seen from the unit physically, or you can derive that from mathematical formulations. Always like that. And then this tells you, OK, if you plug this in, you've got a quadratic form. So if this matrix, or this mobility operator is a positive definite, and then you have energy dissipation. Okay. You can also formulate the same thing using entropy. So the energy, assuming this is free energy, is equal to the internal energy minus T times entropy. So therefore, you can reverse the sign for entropy. And then for entropy, you always have ds dt is going to be positive if M is positive definite operator. Okay. So this is what I call the generalized Onsager principle. Okay. So the starting point is you assume you have two quantities, free energy and mobility. And then you do a simple calculation. Sometimes it may not be that simple. But then you derive these connections. You derive what is your set of variable for the generalized flux. What is the set of variable for generalized force? Then you, re you relate these two sets by the mobility operator. Then you're done. You got a model. Okay? And this model will satisfy the second law, the, 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 uh, the energy dissipation or entropy production or second law of thermodynamics. And then you go back to worry about the other conservation laws. Okay. All right. So if everybody knows any operator can be split into two parts, symmetric versus anti-symmetric. <coughs> so this anti-symmetric part corresponding to what we call the uh, uh, reversible process. Okay. The symmetric part corresponding to the irreversible process. So if, if the undersymmetric part is zero, you only have symmetric part remaining, and then we call this a purely dissipative system. Otherwise, you have both. Okay. So mathematically, this guy corresponding to a hyperbolic operator, and this one corresponding to a, 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 a diffusion operator. So let me put it that way. Now let's see how this works. For example, we consider any thermodynamic systems, as long as you can identify the internal variables describing the system states. Let's call that phi i. And then we assume the free energy is given by the variable is gradient and higher gradients, you know, whatever you, you, you want to include in the free energy. And then you take the time derivative of this energy, so you can write down this into two groups. One is the time derivative of this original internal variables. We call this flux. The other group is called the chemical potentials because they are variation of 
the free energy about this variable. Okay. And now you can see this inner product, you relate this to by the mobility matrix, then you're done. So now you just need to identify what is your mobility matrix. So actually, in reference to Professor Chen's talk, this mobility matrix, we actually define the dissipation functional. So we are actually define the dissipation functional. In, in, in your approach, you, you assume your dissipation function is there, then you do the variation. Okay. So I, that's why I think this is more constructive. Of course, we don't know what it is. Okay. Many times we assume a certain form, then we have to learn or, or determine the coefficient. So for example, if this guy is algebraic, means there's no derivative, then you, you, you immediately pop up with the Allen Kahn systems. If you assume this one is a second order operator, L is algebraic, then we end up with what we call the Allen Kahn systems. Okay. Well, the problem is, how do you know? How do you know what is your dissipation functional? Well, of you assume you have one, then you begin your Ansager's, you know, uh, variation. Now here is we don't know what it is. Okay, let's just put out a general form, and then let's see, based on our experience, see what term should be there. No, I don't know. I, I only know, you know, I can postulate a, a, a certain operator in certain form. Yeah. And then I will try to see, you know, what, what are the coefficients. So I think in, the, in light of a learning, especially machine learning, this will be much more straightforward. We can try to learn the coefficients. Okay? Yeah, I can, I can show you some examples later on. All right? So immediately, you see, uh, we have a... Uh, energy rate of change given by this form. So if this guy is positive definite, we have dissipative systems. Okay. And oh, we can, we can do another you know, simple exercise. We began with this kind of energy, all right? And then we do the uh, uh, time derivative of the energy. Now we, we, we impose our energy is, is non-dissipative. Then we find out M is anisymmetric, and then we pop up with the nonlinear Schrodinger's equation. So you can get all kinds of equations using this, which will, will not violate the second law of thermodynamics. All right. OK, now how do we do this for uh, hydrodynamics? Well, as I mentioned, for hydrodynamics, we have some additional conservation laws. Conservation of mass, momentum, linear momentum, you, know, you name it. All right. So for example, for any system, you, we can impose the, for the total density, mass density will have a conservation of density, unless you have a source. Okay? If there's no source, we have to accept this. And also, we, we assume we have a you know, linear momentum conservation. For some system, we do not require angular momentum conservation, for example, like liquid crystals. All right? And then we need to use the Ansager principle to get all the other equations, what we call the constitutive equations. Okay? Because you can see, in this equation, have a, we have the uh, total mass, we have the average velocity, and we also have total stress, and also the, we call this uh, a body force. Okay. If you count the number of equations unknowns, apparently the number of unknowns exceed the number of equations, so we need to have more equations. And that's the place where we can apply the Ansager principle to get additional equations. That's what we call the constitutive equations. Okay. So uh, let me do one, one simple example. So for example, for binary systems, a binary fluid, you have two different fluids, you, you mix them together, right? And then we have this uh, total mass conservation for the total mass. And then we can identify uh, one component. For example, uh, we have oil and water. For example, the, the density of that oil is denoted by C, okay? And then the density of water will be obtained by the difference between rho and C. And then we can also characterize the microstructure of, of that uh, you know, mixture system. For example, uh, average molecular orientation or the uh, correlation matrices, things like that. So we can introduce what we call the internal variables for the uh, uh, you know, binary mixture. 
So P probably will be representing, you know, certain polar order, and then this will be quadruple order, you know, whatever uh, context you want to endow that with. And then uh, we have this, uh, this uh, you know, uh, equations for conservation of total mass and the conservation of one component. And also we have the uh, conservation of linear momentum. And then again, we need constitutive equations. Okay. So that's where we we bring on the Ansager's principle. So what we do is we postulate a functional form for the free energy, and then we consider the extended free energy, or we call mechanical total energy, all right, where we have a kinetic energy plus the free energy, right? And then we take a time derivative. So all this calculation is, is a straightforward calculus calculation. You bring certain terms to the boundary, and now you retain certain terms in a bulk. So after you know, manipulations, you're going to find out uh, your system actually can be written into two parts. One is given by the surface integral. The other one is given by the bulk integral. In the bulk integral, you have to replace all the time derivative using what we call the environment derivatives, okay? frame indifference, uh, fr frame in environment der derivatives, so which is defined somewhere. All right? And also we have the surface integral. Now, in my first 20 years, I don't know how to impose boundary conditions for PDEs. Because normally, we're given a PDE, we're given a boundary condition, then we, we're asked to do the computation or do analysis. But this actually gives you a hint about how do you impose your boundary condition. Because this tells you the, in the flux of energy going in or out of the boundary. So your boundary condition probably need to address this issue. Do I have an influx or outflux of energy into the system? Okay. Even though it doesn't give you a specific way, but it gives you a, a constraint for you to manipulate, to work on. All right? And then this part, we can use Ansager's principle, because the inner product, you can see every term is inner product. And they can identify using their physical units. One quantity will be, have the same unit as a force. The other one will have the same unit as a flux. So Ansager principle will bring these two groups together. That gives you what you need. All right? So I'm not going to bother with all these uh, you know, uh, symbols, details. Just trust me, they are correct. So in the end, if we drop the surface integral term, we end up with the bulk term. And then uh, one is identified as a flux, the other force. As Professor Chen can see clearly, some of the terms are not really flux. Some of the quantities in here is actually force unit. It doesn't matter, OK? It, it, based on your convenience. So as long as you can separate these two, you relate them by you know, mobility matrix, that will work. So then we, we, we use the Ansager's principle over here. All right. So let me give you some examples. So first one is a binary viscous, viscous fluid mixture. Uh, if I have, for example, this is the stress component, this is the flux component for the second uh, component in the, uh, in the mixture. If I assume these two components is, is related to the rate of string tensor and also this is the gradient of the chemical potential by this mobility matrix. If I take an isotropic tensor over here, I recover my Navier-Stokes equation, incompressibility condition, and also the Kahn-Hiller equation for that component. Okay. It's the simplest form you can imagine of. You get the, the binary system for, for your uh, uh, mixture. So then you can, you, can, you can ask about what happened if I put you know, non-zero entries there. Nobody have ever studied those systems. So it will be interesting to look, at, look into those coupling. So uh, I hope someone will, 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 will have some real physical problem where you're involved in those couplings. So another simple example is a quasi-linear model for viscoelastic fluids. So polymeric fluids, you know, anything with microstructures you can think of uh, can be put into this category. So once again, you identify your, your variables. Uh, one is that uh, stress term. The other one is what we call the conformational tensor. Uh, now this actually the time invariant time derivative. Now we relate these two quantities with the rate of string tensor and also the chemical potential about this Q. Okay. Again, isotropic tensor. But here, because we have this uh, rotational problems, so we have to have the undisymmetrical part included 
in order to define what we call the upper convective derivative. Okay? So both symmetric and anti-symmetric components, but this guy doesn't contribute to the energy dissipation at all. Okay? And then we end up with this couple system, Navier Stokes equation. This is the upper convective uh, uh, derivative, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, considerable equation for polymeric fluids. You can, you can, you can include Ojoy B, Fantan Tanner, uh, uh, Fini, Fini P, and uh, many others, okay? all, all in this form, formulation. Okay. So the third one is, uh, is one uh, uh, Lohengrab and our group uh, lately uh, were interested in, that is, if you have a two immiscible viscous fluid with a different density, you mix them together, the mixture is no longer incompressible. But in the past, most people treat this as an incompressible system. In fact, it can incur signif significant error if you do that. Okay? So we call this a quasi-incompressible system. So once you mix that, and then this grad dot V is not going to be zero, but it's going to depend on the ratio between these two densities. Of course, most of the mixture, the density difference or ratio is close to one, and then it's not a big deal. However, if you have uh, the density ratio which is really close to 10 or 0 0.1, then you are running into big problems because you are not predicting correct physics in that case. All right. So we can use the same, same approach to derive these systems. All right. So I'm not going to uh, see much more details. So that's about the modeling part. So the, the message is the, the, the approach is very general, uh, which respect thermodynamic laws together with other constraints. Okay. Okay. And, but you need to construct two quantities. One is your system free energy. The other one is mobility. Okay. So I want to make a contact with the machine learning because if you can partially this two, basically what, what that means is you assume these two quantities are within certain function space then you can expand that function space in, in the basis so you can have finite sum for each term. Then you use machine learning to learn the coefficients. Now this is called the data-driven discovery of PDEs these days. Okay? It's very hard. I know I mean, a lot of people are, are making big buzz about this, but actually if you look at the technical details, you only need calculus to learn that stuff. So it's a very low learning curve. All right, let me go to the uh, numerical part. Where the machine does the data, right? Pardon me? The machine does the data. Well, uh, that's called machine learning, so I don't know who is learning. <laughs> 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 uh, so for the numerical approximations, uh, so we're going to use the, the method uh, Jason mentioned, it's called the EQ. Uh, previously, uh, Xiaofeng liked to use IEQ. Uh, actually, when we uh, coined this word, we coined the word, uh, we look up Google, and people have already used the uh, EQ, they call it uh, energy quadratization in statistics. But my, my, my friend Xiaofeng said, uh, we don't want to duplicate other people's names, so we add an environment. But uh, after some thought, I think environment might be uh, redundant, so I use EQ. Uh, so it's an energy quadratization. Idea actually originated from Onsager's principle. So I, I will, I'll tell you why. So the goal of the numerical approximation to PD system is and it will have, we have to basically design numerical scheme which will actually converge to the solution of the PDEs. Right? And also we have to have an accurate and efficient numerical scheme so that we can you know, compute the solution accurately and also efficiently. You know? Uh, sometimes you can have very stable scheme, but it's very slow. Probably it's, nobody's going to use that. Okay. So uh, and then the, in terms of numerical methods, we need to uh, uh, consider a few things. Uh, number one is the state stability. Now, as I a comment earlier, for linear schemes, energy stability implies stability of the scheme. So stability of the scheme is equivalent to well postness of the PDE. Right? But for nonlinear scheme, this kind of a link is broken. So energy stability may not imply the stability of the scheme, but we still want to emphasize energy stability because it's easier for us using Onsager's principle to arrive at energy stable schemes than to arriving at actual stable schemes. And also we have several things we need to consider. For example, if we have a density in the mixture system, 
In some places, the certain density is zero. In other places, it's non-zero. But computationally, can we maintain this quantity never go down to negative? So that's called the positivity preserving. This is a very uh, uh, tricky uh, issue. I think a lot of people are paying attention these days. Right? And the other issue is associated with the uh, complex fluids. Uh, yesterday, uh, uh, Zhang Zhen uh, mentioned about this uh, complex uh, polymeric fluids as well. So where we, we always have elastic stress. Now that elastic stress is normally associated with a certain second moment of a probability distribution function. That quantity is supposed to be non-negative definite. However, we always run into a situation computationally, we drive that term to have a negative eigenvalues. And then when that happens, we have a numerical instability. It's called a high, high Weissenberger number problem. It uh, has not been overcome, but I heard people claiming they have already overcome that problem, but I haven't seen the uh, real result. But I know this is a, a very, very uh, big issue for complex fluids community. Okay? So therefore, can we preserve this quantity to have non-negative eigenvalues during the course of the computation? Okay? And of course, we have to conduct the error estimates and convergence. That's the uh, required by the numerical uh, analysis. Right? So finally, we need to have a discrete system uh, which can be solved efficiently. So this is what Jie Shen mentioned about the linearity. So why do we like linear scheme? Because linear scheme is easier to solve. Okay? So, uh, all right. So then uh, I'm going to uh, spend some time to uh, talk about this uh, uh, energy quadratization approach. Uh, to a general uh, thermodynamic system and also hydrodynamic system. So this is the basic idea. Uh, so assuming we have a, a gradient flow, uh, mu is a chemical is a, a chemical potential, which is a variation of the free energy about this uh, uh, internal variable phi. This could be a vector, right? And I, I'm going to just present the idea. Okay. So for example, I'm going to uh, heuristically uh, represent my energy as a quadratic form. So we turn this into a quadratic form, all right? And then uh, we can rewrite, uh, assuming you know, the energy is given by internal variable, uh, the intermediate variable Q, and of course, can be you know, many different forms. And then the chemical potential is evaluated by this now. Okay? Prime means variation in this context. So then I can write down the dynamical or transport equation for this intermediate variable QT. And then you integrate the time rate of change of this, this uh, uh, energy, and then you can get this form easily. So if m is negative definite, I apologize for my switching signs in the notation, and then we'll have energy dissipation. Okay. So now you can digitize this equation using whatever uh, uh, standard technique. As long as you linearize this, you can have a linear scheme in both. And then we'll put them back together through this equation. Then we got the discrete energy dissipation law. Okay. So it's very straightforward. Assembly is basically guided by your derivation of the, of the considered equation. So when you derive, you go from top to the bottom. When you do numerical analysis, you go back up. Okay. So it's a well-guided uh, approach. Very simple. You don't need to you know, do any fancy stuff. Okay. And then you can get a linear scheme. Uh, which is the second order in this case, in time. And then you worry about the spatial digitalization using finite difference, spectral, or finite element, you name it. Okay. Now, of course, there you have to worry about uh, can, I, can I retain, for example, the norms when I do integration by, by, by parts. If you can, you can have the fully digitalized energy uh, stable scheme. Otherwise, you lose that. Okay. And now, let's, let's consider this in a more general setting. For example, if I consider my uh, free energy in a more general form like this, so this is a linear operator, uh, self-adjoint, uh, positive definite. Okay? It can be integral. That would be the nonlinear or fractional de derivative type of thing, if you want. And this is the Bach term. Okay? So this inner product is just like in Jason's talk, is defined as product of f with 1 and integrate over domain. And then you split this two into two parts. The bulk part is split into a quadratic term, and this is already quadratic. Assuming this is linear, okay, it's already quadratic. And then we can reformulate this, this original uh, uh, gradient flow equation into a, a, a slightly you know, augmented system. 
and then we have a you know different coefficient, but we can guarantee you this B is is a linear self-adjoint positive definite. So those are just simple some notation. You put them together. Now we can have the energy dissipation for the extended system or augmented system. Right. And then you, you bring on the uh, the EQ EQ uh, uh, idea. So we can have all kinds of uh, schemes: first order linear, and second order you know backward difference linear, and uh, second order crank nicholson linear. It's all standard you know uh, dissipation. The only thing you need to do is you need to. Uh, do extrapolation here to get a linear scheme. Okay. It's very straightforward, All right? And also we can we can do uh, uh, this is Jason's idea, I guess, uh, using a prediction correction idea to get uh, you know linear schemes. So we first we get a nonlinear scheme, and then we we do iterations here. So we split this into a linear scheme, do the iteration, and it turns out numerically this scheme is is pretty good. Uh, it's better than the other extrapolated scheme. So, uh, and then we can go like Jason mentioned, go higher order. Uh, you can do backward differencing. You can get any order in time. But the problem here is you cannot uh, prove rigorously the energy uh, stability for, for higher order schemes in general. Okay? But we can go another route. So you want to go higher order, arbitrarily high order in time. Let's go uh, let's go uh, Rongakata. And for Rongakata scheme, we can prove rigorously uh, we can get any high order in time. In the meantime, we have energy stability. Okay. So this is a, basically is done because a Runge-Kata scheme is equivalent to time collocation. Okay. So uh, yeah, so this is the uh, time collocation equivalent, and we can claim these two are the same. Uh, so this is basically show we have energy stability. Let me show you some uh, example. For example, this is the uh, crystal growth model uh, using fourth order uh, Runge-Kata scheme. And we start with a, a seed, uh, and then it grows into periodic uh, crystal structures. Okay. So this can be done in 2D and 3D in very efficiently. All right. Another thing I want to show you is uh, energy stability does not infer accuracy. So in other words, uh, if the uh, time step is large, sometimes you can compute the wrong uh, energy uh, using, using this, even though it's unconditional and it's stable, but you do not have uh, the accurate results. All right, and then we can do this for uh, hydrodynamics. I'm going to, I guess I'm going to uh, fly this through uh, because the uh, idea is the same, okay? But the, the, the only difference I want to point out is uh, if we, uh, oops, uh, for example, for the uh, quasi incompressible systems, if we want to, uh, using EQ, we have to quadratize everything in this uh, total energy, okay? So not only we introduce the uh, EQ for the internal variable, we have to also introduce uh, a quadratic variable for this, for this V, all right? I guess uh, my time is running up. I'm going to just go, to, yeah, right here. So I have to introduce a new variable U, which is the square root of rho times velocity. And then this will turn the total energy into quadratic form. Then we can apply EQ on this, okay? So we can show, uh, you know, energy stability, energy stability in both space and time, okay? So this is a three-dimensional uh, simulation for a, a drop, a lighter drop in a heavier fluid. So in, that, in this case, for example, I, I guess the density ratio here is a one to two. So the lighter one is going to rising up. Okay? And I do not want to criticize the other groups, but uh, indeed uh, there's another group of people, they have a thermodynamic consistent theory where they impose grad dot V equal to zero, and the results computed using this and that is different. But I have to point out that in, in the quasi-incompressible model, we respect all the conservation laws. Momentum, mass, but in the other one, they do not respect linear momentum. So in that regard, you know, we, we, we think that model is, is questionable. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go to the conclusion. Basically, we have a paradigm to derive numerical schemes and models using Ansager's principle. So this is very general. I hope, uh, you know, if you want to use this, uh, try it. Uh, learning curve is, is, is very low. It's very easy to learn, very easy to use. But the only problem is we have so many unknowns, for example, in the mobility matrix and also maybe in the free energy. And uh, I, I list uh, several, you know, uh, benefits of using that. Uh, you know, you can read the papers to find out whether or not you believe or not. Thank you very much.
No, I don't learn anything in, in this context. I, I'm saying this can be used to set up a learning for, for energy and also set up learning for your mobility. So you can learn both? You can learn both if you want to do that kind of a data-driven approach. What's the data? Well, it depends on what problem you want to work on. For example, people have already learned uh, Schrodinger's equation. They learned uh, the Burger's equation. What data? Uh, well, wh what they have done, at least from one paper published in science, uh, physics, or something, uh, they, they do the reverse engineering. They use the f equation to produce the data, and then relearn from the data back to the equation to see how accurate they Observations and solutions. Yes. Exactly. That, that's, the, that's the real learning. So you, what you'd like to do is to impose some structure on the model exactly. in order to learn from solutions that you... Learn from certain measurements. For example, you want to learn the conservative equation for the stresses. You ask your experimental collaborator to measure at different uh, you know, shear stresses and the normal stress differences.